A number of years ago, Ford said that the Ranger was dead in America and its replacement effectively was the Ford Fiesta. But that's all changed for 2019, and they've decided to bring their World Ranger back to America. This isn't an entirely new truck for 2019, but it was significantly refreshed in order to Americanize it and, of course, bring it up to date in all world markets. The midsize and compact pickup truck segment is a little interesting to me because this segment has really lacked innovation for years. When you take a look at the Colorado and the Canyon, those are older trucks that General Motors released in other world markets back in 2011. The Toyota Tacoma has really just been refreshed over and over and over again without many significant changes over the years. And honestly, in 2020, although we will be seeing a new Toyota Tacoma, it's again likely going to be just a refresh of the previous gen model. The Ford Ranger in some ways brings brings some new life into this segment, but it also, interestingly enough, is a refresh of that older World Ranger. However, that said, we find more modern features in this Ranger than in any of the competition, so let's take a look. The Ranger is instantly recognizable as a Ford product, but it's also instantly recognizable that this is a blend of their passenger car styling cues and their pickup truck styling cues. So we get that large Ford logo there, a bold grille, but the overall shape of the grille actually mimics what's going on in their passenger car lineup. We have a metal bumper at the bottom, halogen headlamps are standard, LEDs are optional, and then fog lamps below. We also have well-integrated parking sensors in that metal bumper overall. The overall look is a little bit rugged and, of course, a little bit more passenger car-like, which is what shoppers in this segment seem to be interested in. The Ranger is actually a little bit longer than the shortest Ford F-150 that you can buy in America. That's really because of the way that corporate average fuel economy regulations work in the United States. They disincentivize truly small pickup trucks. So you really are unlikely to find anything like those 1980s tiny pickup trucks in America anytime soon. There have been some rumors that maybe Ford or General Motors would create more of a unibody, very, very small pickup truck, but we just don't know exactly if that might come to the U.S. just yet. There are two different bed lengths and two different cab lengths, but you can only combine them into two different combinations. So overall length is identical identical for all Ford Rangers in America. If you get the shorter cab, then you get the longer bed. If you get the longer bed, you get the shorter cab. The big difference in the two cabs is that this one is the four-door cab with doors that hinge right up front. The shorter cab has doors that open only after you've opened the front doors and the cab in the back becomes a little bit shorter. That version seats four, this version seats five. That's the big difference to know between the two. Since this is not a full-size pickup truck, the bed lengths don't match what we find in the Ford F-150. We get a 61-inch bed or a 71-inch bed back here, depending on exactly what cab you choose. Since this isn't a full-size pickup truck, the pickup truck bed sizes don't conform to that standard in the larger segment. We get a 61-inch bed or a 71-inch bed, depending on, again, which cab you choose. Styling out back is pretty typical pickup truck. We have Ranger in large font right down there at the bottom of this tailgate. Again, a large Ford logo. There's a backup camera hidden right there inside it. We have amber turn signals on each side, which is something that I really appreciate in a pickup truck, but something that we don't see in all of the options out there. This makes it a lot easier for someone to tell exactly what's going on behind you. We also have a two inch tow hitch receiver because all versions of this are rated to tow 7,500 pounds. There's a four pin and a seven pin wiring harness connector right there in the bumper. Now, unfortunately, as we're going to talk about later, a trailer brake controller is not available in the Ranger, which is kind of an oddity because it's not commonly available in this segment at all, although General Motors finally offers one in their twin pickup trucks. Under this hood, we find something a little bit different than the competition. Now, four-cylinder engines are not unusual in this segment. Everybody but Honda offers one, but nobody else offers a turbocharged gasoline four-cylinder engine at this time. This is a 2.3-liter four-cylinder engine basically borrowed from the Ford Mustang. Only in the Ford Mustang, it produces 310 horsepower. Under this hood, it's been tuned down to 270 to give it a more appropriate truck power curve. Torque comes in at a very healthy 310 pound-feet. To help improve overall performance and especially towing and payload ability, they've mated this to the exact same 10-speed automatic transmission that we find in the larger Ford F-150. So this is really a very interesting drivetrain combination. This beats the Toyota Tacoma by at least four speeds and the General Motors pickup trucks by at least two speeds. Overall fuel economy comes in the highest in this segment at the moment at 23 miles per gallon combined. If you choose the rear wheel drive model, which is what we're driving right here, obviously it goes down if you choose the available four wheel drive system. Now, some of you may be thinking that's not terribly impressive because some of the full size pickup trucks will get 24 or 25 miles per gallon average. Remember that this particular segment is a lot smaller, so there's not as much room for variation. So we don't have any high efficiency trims of this particular truck. You won't find any mild hybrid systems under this hood, etc. 
Ford has lately been driving a lot of their active safety systems down into even base trims, and we see that for the 2019 Ranger. This now has autonomous braking, lane keeping assistance, and blind spot monitoring as standard equipment on all trims. The blind spot monitoring system also is trailer aware, so if you're towing with your Ranger, the blind spot monitoring system will know what's in the blind spot of your trailer, and of course it will detect cross traffic across the back. But you won't find radar adaptive cruise control as standard equipment that is optional on this particular model. Now it's worth noting that we do find standard radar adaptive cruise control in some of the competition, but I should also mention at this point that for some reason you don't find radar adaptive cruise control in any of the General Motors pickup trucks at all, regardless of whether you're looking at the big ones or the little ones. Before we go on the inside, let's talk more about the pickup truck side of things. Payload comes in at 1,560 pounds minimum, all the way on up to almost 1,800 pounds, depending on the version that you get. Much like the F-150 has the highest payload ratings in the half-ton segment, the Ranger has the highest payload ratings in the mid-sized truck segment, whether you're talking about comparing this to a Nissan Frontier or a Toyota Tacoma or any of those General Motors vehicles. Now, one thing worth noting is that we don't have the same kind of cargo practicality touches available on the Ranger that we do find in that next full-size pickup truck segment. So there's no step integrated into the tailgate, there are no assist steps around the vehicle to help you get into the bed, and we don't find any boxes in the bed or any of that sort of thing here. We also don't find a bed that's as wide as the full-size pickup truck segment quite logically. That means that between wheel well to wheel well, we only have 44 inches, not 48 inches, which would be a little bit more useful of a measure in America where things come in four foot wide increments. However, you can put four foot wide items on top of the wheel wells and you still get about a foot between the top of that wheel well and the top of the bed itself. This is actually a fairly deep bed overall, but we don't have the same kind of cargo dividers or slots where you can put two by fours or two by sixes in here to help divide your cargo that we do find in that next pickup truck segment up. Front seat comfort is relatively good, but these seats are not going to be as large or as cushy as a half-ton pickup truck. We do have a power lumbar support in this driver's seat, but we don't have a power recline in this particular trim. The tilt telescopic steering column has a decent range of motion, and overall this interior feels a little bit like a blend between a crossover and a pickup truck. It's not quite one or the other. The overall seating position is a little bit lower than those larger pickup trucks, but definitely a little bit higher than the average crossover. In case you're wondering, the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver, whether we're talking about this trim or the top end models. If you're a taller person, you should know that these seats don't slide as far rearward as some of those larger pickup trucks. So larger folks may have a little bit of trouble getting a comfortable driving position in here. Before we move on immediately to the rear seats, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the front seats because I have more room back here to demonstrate. In the Toyota Tacoma, because of its overall age, you end up sort of sitting like this in the driver's seat with your feet practically out in front of you and your arms stretched out. It's not as comfortable as the driving position that we find in most pickup trucks, including the Ford Ranger, so do keep that in mind. If you have shorter legs than I do, it's not so much of a problem, but if you're a taller person, that's definitely something to keep in mind when looking at that Toyota. Now hopping back here in the rear, I definitely have enough legroom sitting here behind myself, but obviously this cab is smaller than those larger pickup trucks. I have about an inch of legroom left. Since we're driving the five seat model, there is a middle seat right here. I have about an inch of headroom left if I sit upright, but if I lean all the way back and try and put my head against that rear headrest, then it does touch the back of the ceiling there. Scooting all the way over to the right, you can see that my knees are definitely digging into this seat back because this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. Rear seat passengers get a fold down center armrest with two cup holders. And just as you'd expect in a pickup truck, you can lift the seat bottom cushions upright like that to gain access to a little bit of underfloor storage. Or you can fold the rear seats flat so you can put some items on top of them. Now it's worth noting this does not fold completely flat, but this is how you would gain access to the jack which is behind the rear seats. The model that we're driving today does not have a moonroof, so we don't find one up there. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger and four-way adjustable headrests. These are ratchet style headrests, right like that. This interior is the cloth interior which you find in most of the models. As you might expect, in an inexpensive pickup truck, we have hard plastics at the top of the doors, hard plastics at the bottom of the doors as well. There's a fabric insert right here in this tan area and then a soft touch armrest. As with the exterior styling, the interior styling is definitely a combination of Ford pickup truck styling cues and passenger car styling cues. Some might find this to be a problem, but I actually don't mind this particular blend of styling elements. It makes sense in a smaller vehicle like the Ranger. 
As with the doors, we find a lot of hard plastics on the dashboard, a hard plastic upper section, hard plastic section right there with Ranger embossed on it, hard plastics lower on the dash. Keep in mind that these are going to be more durable than soft plastics. And then at the bottom of the passenger side area, we find a bin style glove compartment. I was not able to fit an iPad inside. Over in the center of the dashboard, we have a small storage cubby above this touchscreen infotainment system. This is Ford's latest version of their Sync software. If I click on over there to the main Sync menu, you'll see that this looks exactly like what we see in their larger pickup truck line and, of course, their passenger truck line as well. This vehicle does have the optional factory navigation interface, so you can click on over to there. You can see that we do have satellite nav traffic as well. Below the infotainment screen, we find the controls for that infotainment system, a power and volume knob, two knob over there, track forward, backward, play button. These again look very much like Ford's passenger car lineup. Then we have the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control, temperature up and down, heated seat buttons right down there at the bottom of that button bank. We then have two 12 volt power ports, one over here and then one on the other side, two USB inputs for that infotainment system, and then a storage area where you can place your smartphone down there at the bottom. Near the USB ports, we have kind of an oddly located button bank. This is where we enable and disable the engine start stop system, turn on and off tow haul mode for the transmission, engage and disengage the parking sensors right there, and the vehicle's traction control system. The shifter is a pretty traditional console design. Sport mode is all the way to the back, drive is one notch above, and then we use these buttons on the side of the shifter to choose gear up and down. When you're in the sport mode, they engage sort of a manual mode where you can select a specific gear. If you're in the drive mode, then it acts more of a gear limiter, so you can limit things to say just gears six and below. To the left of that, we have a pretty traditional handbrake, two medium-sized cup holders, a center padded armrest that opens to reveal a fairly small storage compartment, but I was able to fit some larger items in there. You could probably actually fit a two liter bottle and then still close the lid. This little divider does snap off up front. You can use that for pens or pencils. The instrument cluster looks a little bit more like Ford's passenger car lineup than their pickup truck lineup. We have a color multifunction display between a physical speedometer and tachometer that are styled a little bit more like what we see in perhaps the Ford Focus. That center LCD gives us things like our trip computer, our overall fuel economy. We can also have access to the status of our driver assist systems and, of course, change certain settings in this system. The four-spoke steering wheel looks a little bit more like one of Ford's passenger car designs. On the left side of the wheel, we find the buttons that control that multifunction LCD right there in the middle. We then have the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control, which is optional in the Ranger. Track forward, backward, volume up, down, and then a mode change button. Then we have some dedicated phone buttons, a mute button, voice command button, and then the home button and the gear button actually control the infotainment system in the center of the dashboard, not anything going on up there in the instrument cluster. When you get out on a rougher road like we're driving on here, the Ranger drives just like you'd expect a smaller pickup truck to drive, and that is very much like an F-150, a Silverado, a Ram pickup truck, etc. This doesn't have that same car-like driving dynamic that we see in the Honda Ridgeline, because of course the Ridgeline is based off of a Honda Pilot. It's basically a Honda Pilot with a pickup truck bed in the back, so it drives just like a crossover. The Ranger, on the other hand, is a shrunken pickup truck, so logically it drives like a slightly smaller pickup truck. And that means that when the bed is empty, we definitely have a slightly bouncier feel than you'd find in the average crossover. And generally speaking, the suspension is a little bit bouncier than some of those more performance-oriented trucks. As you'd expect out on the road from a turbocharged entry with a 10-speed automatic transmission, this is the fastest vehicle we have tested in this particular segment. This model ran 0 to 60 in 6.4 seconds, barely beating out the Honda Ridgeline, which was the previous winner. This is notably faster than the Toyota Tacoma, or the General Motors pickup trucks with their V6 engine. In an interesting twist, the rest of the manufacturers offer cheaper base engines, and of course General Motors offers a diesel engine, all of which will be definitely slower than the Ranger. Now if you're comparing base trim to base trim, the difference is going to be even larger, because this is the only engine offered in the Ranger, whereas the competition generally starts out with a naturally aspirated four-cylinder engine that is going to be significantly slower than what we see in this Ford, and also significantly less capable because this engine and transmission combo is good for towing 7,500 pounds in all versions of the Ranger, including the very, very base trim. In our 60 to zero braking test, this vehicle stopped from highway speeds back to zero in 138 feet, which is pretty average for the compact truck segment, and interestingly enough, basically the same as the average half-ton pickup truck as well. As I frequently tell people, remember that this size pickup truck is not necessarily that much smaller than that next category up. We have relatively similar tire sizes overall. The vehicle has just been scaled down to perhaps nine-tenths versus that half-ton truck segment. In fact, overall payload capacity in the bed of this truck may actually exceed some of those half-ton models out there. 
When it comes to overall handling, I'll give this an A compared to the average mid-sized truck in America, but an A- minus when compared to the Honda Ridgeline. The Honda Ridgeline really is an excellent handling small truck in America. And that's to be expected, of course, because it's basically a Honda Pilot with the back cut off and a bed installed instead. So it rides very much like a passenger vehicle, very much like a crossover in America, and it has a torque vectoring all-wheel drive system. That all-wheel drive system can send up to 70% of engine power to a single rear wheel, and that's a big difference between it and any of the other trucks in this segment. This truck uses a very traditional four-wheel drive setup if you have that particular option. The one that we're driving today is the rear-wheel drive only model, and that means that power is being set to the rear axle under most circumstances, but if you were to twiddle the knob, if you had that particular option, it could lock the coupling, send power up front, very much like a half ton truck would. So the overall driving dynamics are going to be definitely different between this and that Ridgeline, but significantly the same between this and the Tacoma, this and the Colorado or the Canyon. But I think overall this has a more refined feel than the General Motors trucks or that Toyota truck. It just feels a little bit more sorted, a little bit better polished out on the road. But again, it still feels like a small truck. Very much like most pickup trucks out there, it feels at once um, a little bit on the firm side and also a little bit on the bouncy or floaty side. That's just because of the way the suspension has to be designed in order to accommodate the large payloads back there. So over some imperfections, you'll definitely feel them come into the cabin. You'll definitely feel those imperfections in corners upsetting the suspension in the rear, just like any pickup truck out there. And of course, you will still feel a little bit of body roll, a little bit of float in the corners. But that said, this definitely comes across as more refined than the average body on frame truck. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, we clocked 73 decibels in this cabin, which does make this a little bit louder than the last Colorado that we tested and the last Ridgeline that we tested as well. But the difference is not too huge. I know a lot of you are going to be offended by the constant Honda Ridgeline comparisons in this video, but the reason for those constant comparisons is because the Ridgeline is the odd duck out here. It's the one that, again, is car-based, so it's going to feel different. It also is the only one in this particular segment that has active noise cancellation, so it's the only one that's going to be quieter. This is, again, substantially similar to the rest of the pickup trucks in this segment that are more traditional body-on-frame designs. But when it comes to overall fuel economy, there's no question. This definitely beats every single entry in this segment. We've been averaging over 23 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving in this vehicle. Now, if you start favoring your driving cycle more towards in-city driving or a lot of hill climbing or towing, then your fuel economy is definitely going to drop right in line with a lot of the competition. And it's worth noting that like other turbocharged engines, if you are planning on towing 7,500 pounds frequently, your towing fuel economy is likely going to be lower than some of those naturally aspirated V6 engines. The reason for that is simply that this engine will have to use more fuel in order to give you that extra torque, that extra boost. And of course, often turbocharged engines like this are using additional fuel to aid in cylinder cooling, and that ends up consuming more gas for those towing maneuvers. However, if you're just doing highway driving or in-city driving, this is going to probably beat everybody else every time. If you're doing a lot of highway driving especially, the fuel economy in this truck is going to be very impressive. We averaged over 32 miles per gallon on a long one-way highway journey, and that is definitely higher than anybody else in this segment, including those naturally aspirated four-cylinder options. You can thank this engine and, of course, the 10-speed automatic for that. This engine and transmission combination are by far my favorite in this segment. We have a great deal of low end torque from this turbo. If you wanted to tune it aftermarket, you could probably find some upgrades to this that will boost you on up to the levels that we find in the Ford Mustang if you're interested. And the 10 speed automatic transmission is a durable transmission that has excellently spread gear ratios. There are a lot of ratios going on in this transmission, so many that it actually skips gears. So if you're starting out gently, it'll start out in first, it will skip second, go to third, maybe it'll skip fourth, go right to fifth, etc. But if you need the maximum acceleration, then it's actually going to go sequentially, one, two, three, four, five, etc. Or if you're towing, that's another reason you want this 10-speed automatic transmission. It has a lot of gear ratios in the middle, so the truck never feels like it's running out of breath going uphill. It always has the right gear ratio for the situation. Bottom line out on the road, if you're looking for the Ford F-150's Mini-Me, this is exactly it. We still have a turbocharged engine, we still have a 10-speed automatic transmission, it's still a traditional truck with an actual frame under there, healthy payload, healthy towing abilities that are, again, very, very good for this particular segment. And the overall driving nature actually feels like a scaled-down version of that Ford pickup truck.
We won't spend too much time on the pricing section because there are a ton of different ways that you can configure your Ranger for 2019. I've posted the pricing here for rear wheel drive models in the different trim levels with the Super Cab and the Super Crew Cab so you can see basically how things scale on up to the top. The important thing to remember here is that for $24,300 you get an automatic transmission, the new 10 speed unit and that 2.3 liter four cylinder turbocharged engine. That's the same engine we see in all Rangers in America at the moment. And that's quite different than we see in the competition. If you were to get the very top end trim that would start at $34,385 for the Super Crew rear wheel drive Lariat, then you'd add four wheel drive, then you'd add some of the extra options on top of it. But interestingly enough at the moment, it doesn't top out quite as high as some of the competition. Now we expect that to change over time because Ford is likely going to be bringing more off-road capable versions of the Ranger. They're probably also going to be bringing perhaps a small diesel engine in the future. We don't have too many details on some of those alternatives just yet, however. With that out of the way, let's move right into competition. And the first competitor is the 800 pound gorilla in the room, the Toyota Tacoma. The Tacoma starts at $25,550, notably more expensive than the Ranger, and you get a 159 horsepower four-cylinder engine that's not turbocharged in that model. You also get one of Toyota's older automatic transmission designs, so the Ranger is definitely more modern. Now there is going to be a new Tacoma coming soon, I'm actually going to be seeing it at the upcoming Chicago Auto Show very shortly probably before you actually see this video go live, but we don't know too, too much about the exact details with the Tacoma. Now we know it's gonna be a new model according to Toyota, but as we have seen with the Tacoma in the past, it's probably going to be a refreshed, even if it's significantly refreshed model, it's still gonna be based on the older model. So I don't expect things like the overall driving position, which I definitely have a problem with in the Tacoma, to change too much for this generation. Now there's a reason that Toyota does not alter the format of the Tacoma too much. They want aftermarket accessories to still be able to fit on the Tacoma, and they don't wanna alienate buyers that have bought Tacoma after Tacoma after Tacoma. It's a very popular vehicle. If you want the V6 engine under the hood of your Tacoma, that'll set you back $28,610, about $4,000 more than a comparably equipped Ford Ranger. It is significantly more expensive. That large price difference continues as we work our way on up the trim ladder. So from the bottom end to the top end, expect to pay more for the Tacoma. Now on the bright side, the Tacoma does have excellent resale value. There is a catch here, of course, however. If you were to buy your pickup truck and then trade it in, say, anywhere between three and four years after you bought it, then resale value is going to be of prime importance. If, however, you're leasing your pickup truck, then honestly, resale value doesn't matter. Just get the best lease deal. On the opposite side, if you were to buy your truck and then just drive into the ground, then resale value doesn't matter to you either. Resale value is only truly important to folks that are in this middle ground, someone that's gonna buy their car rather than lease it, but not keep it forever. Buy it, keep it for about five years or so, three to five years, somewhere in that window, and then sell it on. One of the reasons that the Tacoma has excellent resale value is that it also has excellent reliability. Now on the downside, the Tacoma just doesn't have the same number of features that we find in the Ford, and it also doesn't have quite the same kind of capability that we find in the Ford either when it comes to the overall towing nature of the vehicle or those top end payload capacities either. The Ford also feels significantly fresher. Now again, some of that's going to change because the new 2020 Tacoma is likely going to have the freshest interior in this segment, probably also will likely finally have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto support. It will of course have their latest active safety systems standard as well. So some of this difference can definitely be justified if Toyota keeps their price tag pretty close to the existing Tacoma. And I actually suspect Toyota will because they're no dummy in this segment. They have the biggest share of the pie and in their intent on keeping it with the new Tacoma. So expect to see mildly refreshed engines and transmissions, likely to see them doubling down on standard feature content like that CarPlay and Android Auto system, but we don't know whether a four cylinder engine will still be standard. With that out of the way, let's move on over to the Colorado. The Colorado is very inexpensive for this segment. It starts at $20,200, notably less than the Ranger. Now the big reason that the Colorado starts less expensive than the Ford is that we get a less expensive engine under the hood. It's a four cylinder naturally aspirated engine. But at around 200 horsepower, this actually is a very good base engine to start with. It is significantly more powerful than what we see in the Toyota. It's also significantly more modern and it's mated to a more modern transmission as well. 
Or if you're looking for the best inexpensive option, I would say get the base Colorado over something like a Nissan Frontier. Now, if you want the 3.6 liter V6 engine, then you do have to start adding cash on the hood. $26,230 is the minimum point of entry for that particular model. Another reason you might want to get the Colorado is if you want to get a smaller pickup truck, but you want the big cab and the bigger bed, because you can't do that in the Ranger at the moment, but General Motors does allow you that option in the Colorado. Instead of leaving the overall vehicle the same size and then simply swapping bigger cab for a smaller bed, et cetera, and just shifting that line around, General Motors will actually give you the larger four-door cab and the larger bed as well. Upper end trims of the Colorado and of course its sister ship, the GMC Canyon, do get more expensive than the Ford Ranger. So if you love checking option boxes, keep that in mind. You should also know that although you do find a few features that you won't find in the Ranger in the Colorado, there also are going to be a few features missing as well. For instance, we don't find the keyless go in the Colorado that we do find in the Ranger, but on the flip side, we find an integrated trailer brake controller. And that's the only one that we find in this segment at the moment. Personally, that's really a must if you plan on doing any trailer towing. If you have a trailer with electric trailer brakes, you of course need a trailer brake controller. The integrated ones are not only a good deal, but they also ensure that it's connected properly. Last up, we have the Honda Ridgeline, the truck that is definitely different in this particular segment. Its pricing is also a little bit different. It starts just barely under $30,000, so significantly more expensive than the other alternatives, and ends a little bit more expensive than many of them as well, at $41,920. Towing is on the low end of this segment at 5,000 pounds, but on the flip side, the interior is probably among the most comfortable and the most premium feeling, even though it's not necessarily the freshest. It is, of course, related to that 2016 Honda Pilot, so it has been around for a while. Fuel economy is decent. Handling is absolutely excellent because it handles like a crossover. Of course, that's because it is a crossover, and that's really the origin of the pros and cons that we find in the Ridgeline. It drives more like a car, but then the payload and towing ability is perhaps a little bit more car-like than the traditional trucks in this segment, although Honda has really worked hard in order to try and improve that overall payload rating. The torque vectoring all-wheel drive system is very, very unique in this segment. It really gives it a very good on-road feel, and it has some uses off-road as well, but overall, it's not going to be quite as durable long-term as the traditional 4x4 systems that we find in this segment, and overall maintenance requirements are possibly a little bit higher as well. Unlike other Honda models in America, they chose not to put their Honda Sensing Active Safety System in the base trim. That's an important thing to keep in mind. So that actually means that the Ford Ranger has more standard active safety technology than we find in the Honda. If you want Honda Sensing in your Ridgeline, you have to work your way on up to one of the very top end trims in order to actually get it. It's simply not available even on the lower end trims. So you will find things like radar adaptive cruise control, the autonomous braking system, etc. You'll find those at lower price points in the Ford than we do in the Honda. On the other hand, we find a lot of practical touches in the Ridgeline that I wish other truck manufacturers would incorporate. The storage compartment integrated into the floor of the truck bed is very, very handy in the Ridgeline. And then of course we have the tailgate that not only swings down, but also swings to the side and the in-bed audio system are very nice touches as well. I wish that some of those features would work their way on into the other trucks. As I've said before, the Ridgeline is really all the truck that most shoppers in this particular segment truly need but it lacks those top end capabilities that people really want. It's not gonna tow those heavier loads. It's not gonna have an integrated trailer brake controller. There's no diesel, there's no turbo engine. We don't have a 10 speed automatic transmission. It's not as off-road rugged as some of those others. So if you really plan on really beating up your truck, it's not gonna be the best option in this particular segment. But on the other hand, it is definitely the perfect truck for urban or suburban dwellers. My bottom line in this segment is that if you're looking for a crossover with a pickup truck bed, go ahead and get the Ridgeline. That really is a great option in this particular segment. I like it a lot. But then on the flip side, if you're just looking for the best overall truck, look no further than the Ford Ranger. It really does have an excellent ride. The best overall on-road manners of the more true truck entries in this particular segment excellent payload, excellent towing abilities, etc. Really the only thing that I think is missing is that integrated trailer brake controller and the Ranger would be perfect. Now some folks have derided the overall looks, the overall styling of the interior, but personally I don't mind the more car-like design that we find inside. I think it's an appropriate blend of things 
for this particular end of the segment. If you're looking for something that looks a little bit more truck-like, then of course Ford would love to sell you a Ford F-150. And really, in my mind, the F-150 is the truest competitor for the Ford Ranger because you could get a base model F-150 for not necessarily that much more than the Ranger. So if you're really torn between those upper level trims of the Ranger and lower end trims of the F-150, the F-150 would probably be my selection. It's not going to get that much worse fuel economy. It's going to have slightly higher payload and higher towing abilities. It's not necessarily going to cost you that much more. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. If you haven't already done so, find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos. Be sure and click up there to the top of your screen so you can support this channel. And as always, remember to see if you've actually subscribed. I know a number of you down there have commented, oh my god, I didn't know that I wasn't subscribed. So be sure and check that now, and then I will see you next week.